You might think that we don't need such a thing because citizens of a liberal society have the right to assemble and express their views through protest. But protests do need justification if, say, they violate the law, um, they impose undue, burden, undue burdens on others, violate their rights, destabilize society, or threaten democracy. Some of the contemporary protests do all these things, especially the anti-lockdown, pro-Trump, pro-Trump, pro-police, white nationalist counter-protests on the right, which include paramilitary and vigilante activity by armed militias. But I want to focus on the disobedience from the left, that is uh, the protest associated with the umbrella organization of the Black Lives Matter movement and um, that called for an end to police violence. So the most recent wave of protests began after the police killing of George Floyd on May 25, uh, continued throughout the summer, and uh, the, the, this wave of protests is still ongoing. Um, now, rather than laying out for you the conditions necessary and sufficient for the justification of protest, as philosophers like to do, I want to critically examine the sets of principles and assumptions that are commonly used to assess progressive and radical protest movements. This set of principles and assumptions emerged alongside a romantic, sanitized version of the civil rights movement. It has become the yardstick by which protests are evaluated and the muzzle with which protesters pursuing ra racial justice are silenced. So consider that um, Black Lives Matter protests on the left and anti-lockdown and pro-Trump counter protests on the right have been compared with the civil rights movement. Um, interestingly, Republican officials embraced what they call the lockdown rebellion and other um, pro-police, anti-Black Lives Matter vigilantism. They have denied or condoned their de deadly violence and favorably compared these protests with the civil rights movement. A Trump ally even called anti-lockdown protesters modern day Rosa Parks. Meanwhile, Democratic officials have repeatedly scolded Black Lives Matter protesters for failing to follow the template of appropriate protest handed down by their predecessors. So for instance, Atlanta Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms spoke on May 29 to condemn the unrest of the previous night, which included burning of police cars and looting. She declared, this is not a protest. This is not in the spirit of Martin Luther King Jr. This is chaos. If you care about this city, then go home and pray that somebody like Reverend Beasley will come and talk to you to give you some instructions on what a protest should look like and how you effect change in America. So the idea is that there is a proper way of protesting that can affect lasting political change and which is paradigmatically exemplified in the civil rights movement. So what should a protest look like and why? The answer lies in uh, what I call the civil disobedience playbook. That is the public understanding and standard liberal, including philosophical liberal account of civil disobedience that was shaped in the aftermath of the civil rights movement and is intertwined with the official narrative of the movement. So I'll briefly present each element. And of course, I look forward to uh, hearing uh, Williams' uh, uh, interventions today. Um, and these, the playbook and the narrative boil down to the idea that only civil disobedience, that is orderly, nonviolent protest, can affect change. So civil disobedience in this understanding is a conscientious breach of law undertaken to persuade the majority to change a law or policy in a reasonably just, basically legitimate society. Um, and for a disobedient act to be civil, it must satisfy the following four marks of civility. One, publicity. So agents, civil disobedient agents, must give authority spare notice, act in the open, and appeal to the community's shared principles of political morality, such as the, those embedded in the Constitution. Two, nonviolence, so agents cannot use or threaten to use physical force against others. Three, legal non-evasion, agents must willingly accept and even invite the legal consequences of their action, including arrest, prosecution, and punishment. 
For decorum, agents must act in a dignified manner and treat their opponents with respect to show themselves to be worthy. So a disobedient act that satisfies uh, these criteria is disciplined and so it is legible as a protest. It is not lawless or violent and it does not threaten the social order. It can even be seen as faithful to law and respectful of democratic processes. Um, so the civil disobedience playbook is the script that dissidents and protesters must follow if they're going to um, break the law. It holds that any disobedient protest that falls short of it is doomed to fail because it will alienate potential allies and the public at large, and it will justify violent police repression. So underneath this view is a certain belief about white psychology. The idea that only um, civil protests do, can do the work of moral suasion, winning over the hearts and minds of the white public, appealing to their conscience, eliciting their shame and indignation at the violence inflicted in their names upon upstanding black citizens. So black civil disobedience must be tailored to and constrained by this white, the, its white audience. So the civil disobedience playbook goes hand in hand uh, in the US with the official narrative of the civil rights movement. On the surface, campaigns such as the Good Friday March, lunch counter sit-ins, and freedom rights seem to satisfy these demanding criteria of civility. Activists trained in nonviolence disobey the law publicly, do not respond to state and mob violence, and submitted to arrest and jail. Nonetheless, the official narrative offers a romantic, idealized, sanitized version of the civil rights movement that functions to deter resistance in the present. First, this official narrative distorts political reality. It obscures the strategic and tactical reasons for electing nonviolent direct action and civil disobedience, and wrongly assumes an absolute moral commitment to civility and nonviolence. It also ignores the contribution of radical groups and ideologies to the black freedom struggle or else presents them as impediments to the nonviolent civil rights movement. But the Black Panther Party, black nationalism, pan-Africanism and black workers movement among others had many adherents and showed what black emancipation and self-reliance looked like. Far from obstructing the civil rights movement, they also allowed Martin Luther King Jr. to present civil rights legislation as the only alternative and remedy. Without it, he warned, millions of blacks, quote, out of frustration and despair, will seek solace and security in black ideologies, a development that will lead inevitably to a frightening racial nightmare, unquote. Second, the official narrative functions as counter-resistance ideology to deter resistance altogether and buttress the status quo. It celebrates submission by praising nonviolent activists who absorb violence without striking back to the point of making even self-defense out of bounds in a context of racial terror. Tanaisi Coates recalls in Between the World and Me the documentaries he watched during Black History Month growing up, in which activists were beaten to a pulp, forced to absorb more violence, supposedly to denounce violence. Finally, the perpetual demands for civility ignore and obscure the differentials of power, the fact that it is easy for those in power and harder for entrenched minorities to speak and be listened to and therefore to be civil. What's at stake in the official narrative of the Black Freedom Movement is not simply historical accuracy. Progressive protest movements are systematically judged harshly in comparison with the idealized civil rights activists and branded uncivil and counterproductive to racial progress. In these ways, the official narrative is used to cast a negative light on contemporary protest movements and to prejudice the public against them. So <clears throat> I want to focus on the Black Lives Matter departure from the civil disobedience playbook. But it is important to note against the unfavorable comparison with the civil rights movement, the continuity. So activists are still working to end systematic racial violence and to address 
the same social ills that plagued um, America in the 60s, such as re residential and school segregation, health disparities, poverty, and so on and so on. Um, activists then were condemned as impatient and uncivil troublemakers and, com and seen as um, communist and socialist, and they still are today. They were seen as too radical and revolutionary, and they still are. Think of the Poor People's Campaign or the calls for police and prison abolition. Civil rights activists then were dismissed as no better than segregationists for disobeying the law. That's what Martin Luther King Jr. was addressing in the letter from Birmingham in part. Today we are told there is violence on both sides or very fine people on both sides. Activists then and now are seen as alienating potential allies and they are brutally repressed by the police. Police have beaten and injured hundreds of um, unarmed peaceful protesters this year. As of June 2020, 14,000 arrests had been made, and I couldn't find a recent number. Um, many people are arrested on misdemeanor charges, but many also on very serious charges of felony and even terrorism. So, continuity aside, Black Lives Matter activists have deliberately sought a new path for their movement with the slogan, Not Your Grandfather's Civil Rights Movement. They are the children of Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X. They deploy mass civil disobedience tactics and try to work within the legal system on the one hand, and they embrace Black pride, self-reliance, and defiance on the other end which whites um, often construe as instability. And Black Lives Matter activists also deploy on civil disobedience tactics. So many Black Lives Matter protests have been peaceful and civil, but there have also been instances of vandalism, looting, and rioting, um, some but not all as a result of far-right infiltrators. Protesters defaced and toppled Confederate monuments. In some cities, guerrilla artists replaced these with new monuments. Local police and National Guard forces have quelled the protest with tear gas, batons, and rubber bullets. Even though disease experts are warned that dousing crowds with tear gas and pepper spray will accelerate the, the spread of coronavirus. Armed white nationalist militias have attacked Black Lives Matter protesters, killing two in Wisconsin. So to protect themselves from, um, and others from police and counter protesters' violence, demonstrators wear goggles, helmets, helmets and homemade shields. They use leaf blowers against tear gas and carry milk and antacids as remedies for the effect of pepper spray. We are far from the civil disobedience playbook, which demands activists absorb blows to demonstrate their com commitment and worthiness. Protesters do not apologize for their expressions of defiance, grief, and rage. They do not shy away from giving offense either. Deliberately offensive acts of disobedience are naturally well suited to express disrespect and defiance to provoke and jolt. Black Lives Matter protests all over the world have featured um, virulent anti-police chants, which are condemned as obscene and antagonizing, yet these purport to convey the lethal urgency of uh, the matter. So this kind of incivility stands in direct opposition to the lofty um, demands of the virtue of civility in the public discourse, which is supposedly premised on the recognition of each other as democratic equals. And I think that's exactly um, what Black Lives Matter uh, activists are trying to denounce. So the current uprising denounces the pretense of democratic equality and highlights the reality of racial oppression by flouting civility. It denounces white demand of black civility as unfair, given the lack of care and concern for black suffering. The movement does not seek moral suasion. It does not seek to mollify white sensibility. Yet maybe, just maybe, it has done these things and more. And I want to end with the striking fact that the protests appear to refute the received wisdom that nonviolence and civility are essential to the success of social movement. So according to uh, uh, the latest Gallup poll from the summer, 65% of US adults support the protest. 
tens of millions of people participated in the protest, an estimated six to 10% of the US population, making it perhaps the largest social movement in US history. The summer's uprisings show that incivility is no barrier to mass participation and popular support. The protests have sought to promote democratic legitimacy, and for a large part, they have been seen as doing just this. The movement then may well have expanded the repertoire of acceptable protest and revisited the template of what a protest should look like. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Candice, for this presentation. That was wonderful. Um, so let's uh, let's move on to to William, um, and um, then we can have questions later. William, are you going to do sharing? Yeah, can you see my screen? Looks great. Looks great. Okay. All right. Wonderful. I just want to say. Uh, Thanks to the PAR Center for inviting me, um, especially Sarah Stroud and Jordan Leifer for uh, making this possible. And thanks to all of you for your audience. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here. So I've been asked to talk about the historical perspective on the effectiveness of protests, specifically during the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 1960s, um, especially the question, what kind of effectiveness did protests in particular have been contributing to change and what do you think was the reason or source of their effectiveness? And I have a very clear sense of that. I'm gonna talk about that right now. So I'll talk about the civil rights movement, something that we're all somewhat familiar with, um, but then I'll talk about something that's very important to the civil rights movement that you probably haven't actually heard a lot about. Um, so let me start here, Greensboro, 1960, you all have seen this image before. I imagine everybody's seen this image or an image like it. This lunch counter is, still exists in Greensboro. You can go the, down the road there and see it. February 1st, 1960, these four young men, Azel Blair Jr., David Richmond, Franklin McCain, and Joseph McNeil walked into Woolworth's department store lunch counter, sat down at the lunch counter in the whites only section. Okay, they come back the next day. They come back the next day after that. Each time they're, that they're there, they are not served. The, um, the manager of the, of the lunch counter says, sorry, but we have to close. We cannot serve you. And of course, word of this sit-in spreads across the entire country. And from February 1st in Greensboro, we get different sit-ins happening a week later in Durham, North Carolina, um, Hampton, Virginia, within two weeks, February 23rd, Chattanooga, Tennessee, by late February, Baltimore, Richmond, Montgomery, Nashville, and Atlanta, right? These iconic images of this wave of sit-ins as they spread across the American South in the early 1960s. This is from Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Um, there's now a marker right outside of Weston Wine Bar where the sit-in occurred. By mid-April, within just two and a half months, Roughly 50,000 people had joined this sit-in movement all across the South, not just black people, white people as well. America had had sit-ins before, but nothing like this. It was on an unprecedented level as tens of thousands of members of this young generation joined this incredible movement. The spring of 1960, that spring, they were called together to Raleigh, North Carolina at Shaw University by a veteran activist and civil rights organizer named Ella Baker who encouraged these young people to come together to form their own organization. And when Ella Baker tried to explain what she wanted, what these students wanted to do, she said this, and I quote, whatever may be the difference in approach to their goal, the Negro and white students, North and South, are seeking to rid America of the scourge of racial segregation and discrimination, not only at lunch counters, but in every aspect of life. What came out of that meeting in Raleigh, North Carolina, of course, was the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, also known as SNCC for short. And these young people believed that they could change the world. Um, SNCC gave us some incredible young people. The ones that you probably mo are most familiar with are Julian Bond on the left here, and of course, John Lewis on the right. And it's a generation of people who in the early 1960s, who in 1960 especially, 
thought that they could use protests to end Jim Crow. Okay, Jim Crow was a system of racial apartheid that had existed in the South since the 1880s, almost 80 years. And here they are in 1960, thinking that they could end Jim Crow themselves. It's an incredibly odd, it's just the level of audacity that they, you know, held that they could be the ones that in this system that had dictated life in the American South. It's just absolutely amazing. It's hard to wrap your head around that they could even, you know, conceptualize this belief. But that's exactly what they set out to do. And that's exactly what they did, right? So from the spring of 1960, they start working and Jim Crow is gone within essentially five years. So the civil rights movement itself is of course one of the most celebrated acts of protest in the history of the world. Not just in the United States of America, but all across the globe, be it South Africa, you know, in, in Europe, in, in Asia, in Vietnam. Um, and one of the stories that Americans like to tell themselves is that the civil rights movement works because America is inherently good and ethical, and it's always moving toward progress. But if that were the case, then black people would have started these sit-in movements in the year 1619. The real reason lies in the tactics and the historical context, okay? So the sit-ins themselves were designed to accomplish a number of different things. Clog businesses and hurt companies financially, hoping that some would eventually break down and desegregate because it actually hurts business, okay, there's that. Um, fill up the jails, have so many people arrested that you fill up the jails and um, <clears throat> challenge the system in order to break it. Or they could expose violence. And of course, this is the most powerful result, right? They know, these activists know, that sit-ins and demonstrations could attract a violent response. And that violence would then attract the media coverage that would then help expose others to just how bad Jim Crow was and pressure politicians to react. So by 1960, the potential for media coverage of violence to generate a greater reaction is, is um, greater than ever. One reason is television, okay, that's essential. Um, coming out of the 1950s, a lot more Americans have, the TV, have TVs. Another reason is the Cold War, I'll talk about that in a minute. But the third reason is the black vote, okay? The greatest gains of the civil rights movement come between 1960 and 1964 when politicians are worried about the African-American vote. So it's no coincidence that 1960, these sit-ins, right, they emerge and they become very effective during a presidential election year, all right? That election year, we see Richard Nixon versus John F. Kennedy, okay? In 1960, the black vote mattered more than it ever had before, largely because of the migration that had occurred during World War I and then again during World War II, okay? During the 1940s and 1950s, 3 million African Americans left the American South. And they go to places where they can do something that they could not do in the American South, and that is vote. So they flee Jim Crow in part to get access to the vote. And they don't go everywhere. The black people don't largely move to Kansas and Nebraska, you know, as you know. They move primarily to seven states. And in a presidential election year, think about the importance of these seven states in a presidential election. New York, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Ohio, Michigan, Illinois, and California. So 1960, those states combined for about 197 electoral votes. If you win those states, you're gonna win the election. Both candidates pursue the black vote. Okay, so as they are campaigning, right, this wave of sit-ins is spreading all across the country. Now, <clears throat> there was a time in this country during the time that I'm talking about, where the black vote was really up for grabs. Black voters tended to lean, Democrats certainly, but look at 1956, the previous presidential election. According to this Princeton University poll, 61% of African Americans voted Democrat, but 39% voted Republican, right? There were good reasons for Richard Nixon as the Republican nominee to think that he might be able to count on some, on a lot of black people voting for him. Okay, and even these numbers dwarf what we all know will happen in the 2020 election. Okay, but in 1956, a lot of black people still vote Republican. Going into 1960, Richard Nixon very much has a strong argument with black voters. There's several reasons for that. One, the Republican Party is still the party of Lincoln. He was vice president during Brown versus Board of Education. 
during the Little Rock integration. And as vice president, he regularly took diplomacy trips to Africa, including a 1957 trip to Ghana with Martin Luther King Jr. to celebrate Ghanaian independence. He also had some pretty major endorsements, including this man on the left here, Jackie Robinson, the most famous black athlete in the world at the time. Um, and then also Martin Luther King Jr.'s dad, Richard Nixon was also at the time a dues paying member of the NAACP, and he thought he had a lot of black support kind of in the bag. Um, John F. Kennedy, <clears throat> meanwhile, has to compete a little bit harder. So of course, Kennedy is a Massachusetts Senator going into this 1960 election. He's the son of a wealthy businessman, and he's a World War II veteran. Kennedy also knows that he needs to pursue the black vote. One of the first things that he does is he calls up Martin Luther King Jr who had become very famous because of the Montgomery bus boycott. And he tries to appeal to King for an endorsement. And King says he needs to do something dramatic, refuses to endorse either candidate, actually. So what does Kennedy do? He does a number of different things to appeal to black voters. One, his dad launches a big program to help raise money for scholarships for African students and gives $100,000 of his own money. They publicize that. You see that in the right, this news article, right? This aid to African students. When Kennedy travels north, he seeks out urban black audiences and he backs civil rights legislation. He does all these interviews with black newspapers. I'm, I'm sharing here several clips of black newspapers in places like Pittsburgh and Chicago covering Kennedy's record on civil rights. And when he's in the north, he's talking about civil rights and advocating for them all the time. Um, when Martin Luther King Jr. is arrested in Atlanta a few weeks before the election, Kennedy makes a big show of calling his wife to help try and reassure her. And then his campaign distributes 2 million pamphlets publicizing that call outside of black churches. Now, if you look at how the election plays out, bear with me. This map is, it's a good map, but our colors are reverse. So red is actually Democrat here and blue is Republican. Um, but, but look at the popular vote, how close this election was, right? It's a razor thin margin. Just over 100,000 people separate them in the popular vote. You see the electoral vote. And the black vote, the JFK takes about 61%. Um, sorry, that's, yeah, JFK takes about 61%, Nixon about 39%. Um, but if we look closer at some of these states, like Pennsylvania, you can see where the black vote comes in to really tip the balance of power here. So Pennsylvania has a black population, 1960, of 852,750. Kennedy wins by about 116,000 votes, okay? Um, he largely does so because he wins the black population. So in this map, again, red is Democrat, blue is Republican. So Kennedy loses most counties in Pennsylvania, but he wins some key counties, including Philadelphia County, which is, of course, where most black voters live. If we go to Michigan, again, blue being Nixon, red being Kennedy, right? Kennedy only wins by 67,000 votes, but he wins Wayne County, okay, where most black people lived. Of course, Detroit is in Wayne County. Illinois, red is Kennedy, blue is Nixon, okay? Um, Illinois has, what, 101 counties, and Nixon wins 92 of those counties. But Kennedy wins Cook County where Chicago is. Barely wins the state of Illinois, but of course he gets 27 electoral votes for that. New York has a much larger margin. Kennedy wins Queens County, Kings, New York, Bronx, all of those. Just those states alone gave JFK 124 electoral votes. Had Nixon taken Illinois and Michigan, he would have become president. The black vote was crucial. Um, if you don't want to take my word for it, it was a very famous interview with Richard Nixon in Ebony Magazine just two years later. And this is how he explains the loss. And I quote, I could have become president. I needed only 5% more votes in the Negro areas. But then the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. case came up. The Democrats whipped up a fury in Negro areas. I was painted a villain and my entire record was erased in weeks. So the point is this, just months after that first wave of sit-ins, the black vote has an enormous effect on the 1960 presidential election. Kennedy knows this throughout his presidency, and he feels pressure to respond to this black vote. There's no reason for him to think that the black vote won't also play a crucial role in 1964, because black voters will then again ask him, well, what did you do on civil rights? Okay. Now, of course, John F. Kennedy does not know 
that he is going to get be shot and killed in 1963. He also does not know who the Republican Party will nominate in 1964. But as it looks, you know, as he takes office, it certainly appears that the United States of America um, is going to watch what's happening with civil rights. Of course, the other issue here is the Cold War. And I only have so much time, so I'll zip through this. But look, the United States and Russia and Soviet Union are in this global Cold War to exert their influence, right? And in the wake of World War II, the so-called War for Democracy, the United States is telling all of these countries, and you see their year of independence denoted on this map, telling all these newly independent countries, look, you should fall under our sphere of influence, okay? Um, but of course, the Soviet Union, anytime there's race news out of America that looks violent, the Soviet Union is saying, well, look at how they treat non-white folks over there, okay? So that's another enormous part of this context. But it's within these, this context, in the years to come, that the civil rights movement has its greatest gains. And there's all sorts of highlights. But if we turn to Birmingham, 1963, the protests, right? When it becomes global news about what's happening in Birmingham, that's exactly the moment that Kennedy gets up in front of America and says 100 years of delay have passed since President Lincoln freed the slaves, yet their heirs, their grandsons are not fully free. Next week, I shall ask the Congress of the United States to act, to enact legislation giving all Americans the right to be served in facilities which are open to the public, hotels, restaurants, theaters, retail stores, and similar establishments. That legislation he called for in June of 1963 is what would become the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Of course, a couple of months later, in August, organizers planned the March on Washington, another massive demonstration designed to increase pressure to pass meaningful civil rights legislation. 250,000 people come in from across the country, about a quarter of them are white. And the symbolism is just epic. It's the 100 year anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation. King is standing in the shadows of the Lincoln Monument, right? And he says, five score years ago, a great American in whose symbolic shadow we stand today signed the Emancipation Proclamation. We have also come to this hallowed spot to remind America of the fierce urgency of now. He samples the Gettysburg Address, the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, and the song, My Country Tis of Thee, in perhaps the most patriotic speech ever given in this country. Of course, like I said, Kennedy doesn't know that he won't live to see what would become the Civil Rights Act that he called for. He also would not ever been able to anticipate that the Republican Party took a fundamentally different direction. But in 1964, the Republican Party voted to nominate a man who voted against the Civil Rights Act, who voted basically against ending Jim Crow with Barry Goldwater. And the Republican Party took a very big turn. And the results of that were that African Americans left the Republican Party in 1964. They have never come back. Um, no Republican candidate has gotten over 15% of the vote since 1964. And of course, that was not the case if we go back just to the 1950s. But it was in these years, in between these years, when the civil rights movement got its greatest traction. So not just by exposing the horrors of Jim Crow, but showing politicians that there could be real political consequences for not backing African American civil rights. So I'll go ahead and end there and um, we can open this up for discussion. Great, thank you very much, William. This was this was fascinating. Um, I think we should open it up for discussion right away. Um, let me take a look here, and I propose that you just raise your hand, um, and then I will just call on you. Okay, and bear with me here for a second when I see hands coming up. I don't see any hands coming up. Is that possible? Yeah, there we go. Okay, um, Pavel, why don't you jump in? Hi, uh, thank you both so much for, for the talks. These were, these were fascinating. I'm, I'm trying to think, um, um, Dr. Stur Stur uh, Sturkey, sorry, <laughs> um, what you think the implications for um, today's movement are? Is it, is it that there, um, there isn't a clear sense from both parties uh, that perhaps the black vote still really matters it can have political consequences so that both parties are able to like in a way ignore these mass protests that we're seeing um 
Yeah, how have conditions changed in your eyes to, um, to see this kind of difference between what was happening in the civil rights movement, if, if anything is different? Um, thank you. Thanks, yeah, I, I think that is certainly part of it. Um, you know, I only had a few minutes. So one of the other things that obviously happens is a lot of white people are also drawn to the cause of civil rights. And that's really a different issue. And it also becomes a political issue for white folks. And I think that's something that has happened today, but it's really only shaping the politics of one particular party. You don't really see any meaningful response from the GOP because I don't think there is any political reward for them responding to Black Lives Matter necessarily. And I think that, you know, there might be some gestures here and there, you know, people denouncing racism, that sort of a thing, but there's no real tangible you know, um, incentive for them politically, I would say. In fact, it's just the opposite. And I think that's why you wouldn't see any sort of meaningful legislation. And I think that's also why you see people refusing to even say the very basic um, name, Black Lives Matter, you know? So I think that's one of the things that's happening here. And if there is, I mean, look, our demographics are going to give way in this country to a point where one party can't just simply ignore all racial minorities in this country. I mean, that's just that's just where we're going. It's where we've always been going. It's just taking a long time. And you know, at some point, I think this is going to be a contest again. It's really unhealthy democracy when an entire racial group votes ninety five percent one way. You know, like what the hell is happening? So um, we'll see what happens in the future. Lucha, I can't raise my hand. Is it fine if I ask my question? It's good. Yeah, just jump in. That's great. Sure, sure, sure. sure. Um, thank you so much, Professor Sturkey and Professor Delas. This, this were, uh, that was, these were amazing series of uh, provocations and, uh, and reflections. Um, I am wondering uh, maybe a particular question for Professor Delmas, uh, the question that, you know, Balibar and Valerie Stein in class, race, race and uh, nation they raised in that book is that there is, a there is an inherent relationship between the images of nation, the construction of a nation and the notion of race, meaning any idea of racism um, in, is somehow linked to the idea of nationalism and any form of nationalism is predicated on an understanding of a, a race. But what they say is that this is ambivalent, meaning that there are two notions of nationalism in national uh, emancipation movements of the, of the post-colonial states. You have a positive notion of nationalism and now we see in, in France, in Europe and in the United States a negative notion of nationalism. Can you articulate again this relationship between not necessarily class, race, and nation, but more specifically nationalism and racism? Thank you. I hope it was coherent. Um, thank you for your question. I don't know if I can uh, do a better job than you just did. <laughs> so, um, I, I, so, I think that in, um, so, it, uh, uh, Freedom struggles like the decolonization movements, like Franz Fanon, uh, post-colonial theory tells us, have to be efforts to um, reconstruct and invigorate the nation. So not a return, but a building anew um, with its own new arts and literature and um, the national pride, linguistic pride, development of the resources and so on. And that is, um, so, so as in that positive aspect is not necessarily so much present, I think in uh, the non-maximalist social movements, right, in domestic spheres. But I, um, so there, there's, so in the, right after Trump was elected, there was actually much um, talk of patriotism again. So the ACLU at on, and the Center for Constitutional Rights had on their website, Dissent is Patriotic. And I think it was an important effort to uh, reclaim the national identity talk. Um, and in the Black Lives Matter movement, I think there is um, 
there is there are like radical constitutionalist efforts so efforts to really take um the principles of constitutional morality at its word and 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 really use them at, as tools of emancipation in a way that can i think uh, evoke that 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 positive connotation so i mean there's the apro pessimism of the you know inherently um racist uh, building of the american nation but there are also uh, many other uh, strands of the of the current uh, freedom struggle that evoke a kind of perfectibility so well, i would say that thank you very much thank you Can if I can jump in with a with a question that that sort of has always bothered me, and and having William here, you know, I just want to ask this question. I mean, why bury Goldwater? I mean, that just seems like stupidity of the Republican Party. Um, they were fighting for the black vote. Do they just completely give up on it and say, well, if we can have that, then we're going to get the white Southern vote? Um, and then Nixon just seems to go in the Barry Goldwater street anyway afterwards. So does he just, does the whole thing just flip at that point or what's going on there? Yeah, so Nixon in 68 is different than six, the Nixon in 60, um, but he's also somebody that's not necessarily attached to the establishment in 64 when they got routed. Barry Goldwater got destroyed in the presidential election. Um, but what, what, what happened to lead to his nomination was that A, the field was fairly weak but then also it was a lot of civil rights reactionists, but then also people who were reacting to the possibility of, the, of what became the great society, right? So expanding our federal welfare state, you know, creating programs like Medicare and Medicaid, which were foundational to the great society. So there was this revolt against the Republican party and any support of that. But what happened in 64, well, two big things. That's the first time the deep South went Republican since reconstruction. So for all intents and purposes, that literally in that exact moment is when Mississippi <clears throat> or sorry, Georgia, South Carolina, places like that, that's the first time the Republicans actually got a foothold in when a lot of these folks said, well, to hell with the Democratic Party and Lyndon B. Johnson, you know, we're Republicans now. It's also the last election that a Democratic presidential candidate got a majority of the white vote, 1964. Never happened again since then. And, um, you know, it's just historic in all these different ways. But uh -huh. yeah, I mean, it's a lot of it's the reaction to the civil rights movement, but it's also to the great society. I see, I see. Okay, interesting. Um, Sarah, I have, I'll have you jump in. Thank you, thank you. Great, thanks. Um, hang on, I, I may not be able to get my video going. My internet's a little unstable, but my audio is okay, right? You guys are, you guys are hearing me? Yeah. So thanks so much, uh, Candace and, and William. Um, the, the interplay between your two presentations, I just found absolutely fascinating um, uh, and just want to sort of take advantage of having you both here in the Zoom room to um, kind of get you, uh, get both of your perspectives on uh, something that, that Candace raised at the end. Um, so we had, we had wanted to do something that both talked about the ethics of protest. Is there a, you know, sort of a, a, a right way to protest and a wrong way to protest, but also their effectiveness and, um, you know, Candace, as, as you mentioned, there may be powerful moral arguments for why protests um, should at times be uncivil. Um, but um, the very last thing you said sort of brought together the issues of, of ethics and effectiveness by saying that one of the reasons that maybe we've always walked around with this template that protests should be very civil and um, obedient is that there's a belief that that's the only way they can be effective. Um, and according to you, that's kind of been blown out of the water by the BLM and the, the social movements that we're going through now. So I just thought that was really fascinating. And I guess 
I mean, I guess my reaction was, don't you think the jury is is maybe still out on on that, right? I mean, William was talking about the audacity of thinking that they could get rid of Jim Crow, but but then they did, right? And I think it's fair to say that we haven't yet gotten um, any clear evidence that there is going to be lasting change coming out of out of these um, out of out of these protests. So. Um, I did want to kind of ask you to expand a little bit on that. And I wanted to get William's perspective, you know, from what you've said about the civil rights movement, it sounds as if it was sort of a perfect storm of factors all working together that, you know, brought the effectiveness that those protests had. Um, and so I wondered, you know, from your historical perspective, how important was the specific way in which they were protesting this kind of nonviolent paradigm that um, you know Candace thinks we we can now sort of throw out. That is, would would you tend to agree that the sort of nonviolent character of the sit-ins and so on maybe wasn't such a key piece of the puzzle? So in short, I, I kind of wanted to to hear from both of you about this fascinating issue of mode of protest and its relation to effectiveness. That, sorry, that was kind of a long-winded thing, but as you see, I got, I got excited about the, uh, the relations between your two talks. So please, interested to hear from both of you on that. Um, yeah, great question, Sarah, thanks. So um, there isn't enough social scientific research really to bring the, an empirical picture about the potential tactical efficacy of uncivil disobedience tactics, right? Not now. There's, there's now some research on riots. Um, Warsaw, Omar Warsaw, Warsaw, sorry, um, suggested uh, some uh, negative effects of riots in certain cases, especially in a, in a political uh, context and given upcoming elections, so uh, bringing people to law and order candidates. But in uh, other riots um, can be effective, so Stonewall was really effective in uh, advancing the um, gay rights movement. It's also important to note that we would need these research to be really context sensitive. So for instance, the existing social science research in Europe does show that riots work. They uh, do lead to commissions to investigate the origins, the causes of unrest. And then the government sometimes do act on the basis of the recommendations of these commissions. So, you know, different, it, it will work differently in different ways. But in general, it's also important to like think about what we mean when we, you know, so if you're doing social science, social scientific research into the efficacy of protest, it's like, how do you measure success? So the, the Occupy Wall Street, the re previous wave of Black Lives Matter um, protests are deemed uh, failures. And yet that would, that, that's only acceptable if you think that, you know, putting something on the agenda or like um, raising consciousness and awareness about something doesn't matter. And, you know, I mean, there's good reason to think that this summer's ra racial reckoning wouldn't have happened, but for all the work, all the grassroots organizing that has been going on since 2013, and of course itself, um, uh, preceded by many uh, waves of activism. So all these questions really matter. But yeah, the jury is still out on uncivil disobedience tactics, but the jury doesn't say they don't work yet. And um, uh, William started by talking about the media coverage, right? So the reasoning, the tactical reasoning was nonviolence will still be violently repressed, and that will uh, be covered by the media, and that will look really bad. Um, in some way, in some way, the, we there's the the a fatigue effect. A you know we need like more spectacular things to attract attention, and I think incivility does that very well, right? So it is more likely to be covered. And again, by incivility, I don't just mean violence, right? I mean like offensiveness or just spectacular things or just the self-defense. I think that right now when we see uh, protesters defending themselves and others from violence, 
we see something that's also worth covering and worth talking about. And that doesn't show them to be um, less worthy and less dignified. So, so as, as in like we, I, I, what I think is happening is a slow shift of an aesthetic, a new aesthetic of persuasion that won't just rely on the display of suffering by the agents. Uh, thanks for your question, Sarah. So I've, two things that I really want to talk about here. First of all, the civil rights movement was incredibly unpopular early on. Okay, in ways that would shock many Americans today. In August of 1963, Gallup did a poll, and only 23% of people had a favorable opinion of the March on Washington, one of the most famous protests in American history, one of the most revered protests, 23% favorable. In June of 63, just a few months earlier, only 60% of people surveyed said that protests hurt the case for racial equality. 60% of people said protests hurt the case for racial equality. So what happened in the civil rights movement was I think actually pretty similar to what's happening now in that um, how you make an argument, right, for, for your goal. And what happened in the civil rights movement, and this is, a, this is astonishing just as much as it was this vision that they could end Jim Crow, but this idea of redemptive suffering. The nonviolence, the quiet part that no one ever says, really relied on violence to make the argument. So people like John Lewis believed in redemptive suffering in that you would absorb violence on your body to then redeem the soul of America, to save it from itself, okay? And key to that was, of course, having cameras there, letting the media know that you were going to be there. But the other key to that was that violence was going to happen. So there were entire you know, campaigns that weren't that violent that nobody's heard about. But the ones that were violent are the ones that make the argument, okay? You see... Who the viol who's committing the violence, who's absorbing the violence, and there's no moral, you know, that's, there's moral clarity there. And I think as we relate that to what's happening now, look, the argument is made through cell phone videos. That's where Black Lives Matter comes from. None of this is new. They were protesting police abuse in the 1950s, 1960s, and ever since then. But now, as opposed to saying, well, this person got shot by a cop, and the response is, well, we don't know what they did, there's a video. There's nine minutes, that man's knee on George Floyd's neck. And I think that, as much as anything else, has, you know, into this argument that's basically saying that we need police reform, because you can turn on your TV and you can watch it for yourself. The other thing, too, really quickly, is you see what the other protesters look like. And this is also related to Confederate monuments. The argument over Confederate monuments, you know, Black people have you know, wanted to get rid of those for a long time. But it's only now when you see a group of men with torches, you know, they could pick any symbol in America to go to to demonstrate and chant Jews will not replace us, and they pick a Confederate monument. Or you see Dylan Roof, right, this mass murderer who is a white supremacist, wants to start a race war. When you look at his Facebook, you know, how did he justify killing people in Charleston? Well, he went to Confederate monuments. And so to me, it's those other people right, who are active that are also helping to make this argument. Look, you're muted. I just never can master the art of Zoom, you know. So, Pavel, you want to jump in? Thank you very much, I said to the, to the, to both respondents, yeah. Yeah, th thanks again for uh, letting me take another question. I, I don't want to keep you longer than um, than you you know you sh you want to be here. <laughs> um, but I had a, yeah a similar question to Sarah's um, Sarah's question, which just a little for a little background. Like I'm very um, influenced by two figures politically. On the one hand is the late great Gene Sharp, who has this you know wonderful theory of nonviolent resistance that's grounded in, in ethics, and he makes very much the same point that. Um, Professor Sterkley made uh, that, yeah, the, this, the tactic itself requires the willingness for the other side to be immoral, to use violence for this to then, you know, what he calls um, uh, the judo of nonviolent resistance to, to work. Um, so that requires, you know, this is why you, a lot of these nonviolent movements are so uh, militant about the, the responses they have and why there has to be tight order in this, because otherwise, is it where the trick doesn't work? Um, on the other hand, I'm really influenced by Lenin, 
and <laughs> these really militant uh, tactics of organizing and, uh, and armed resistance, right? So I'm wondering if this is, a, I guess, a question to Professor Delmas. Um, if I agree with you that the, the, the way in which we're looking at the ethics of um, protests is changing, and I'm wondering if that is not to the detriment of the effectiveness because it does deprive of the kind of uh, political judo that you could make if you were able to, as it were, keep your hands supremely clean and only see the, you know, the, the evil of the opposition. Um, is this, and this is again not in, to say that it wouldn't be ethically justified, um, as you've pointed out, there are really great ethical justifications for this, but whether or not we're, we're getting ethical justification in another place at the expense of um, this practical ability to do this. Thanks, this was very long, but uh, yeah. Um, thank you for your question, Pavel. Um, so, um... I, I don't read Jean Sharp as saying that nonviolence works to the extent and only when it, uh, it, it um, invites or a, a violent uh, repression, right? So the, the, the background of Sharp is the, some, the, a theory of the state like Gandhi's where um, the power of the state, no matter what kind of government, even a tyranny, really relies on the cooperation of its people, even if those people are subjugated. And the importance of nonviolence for Sharp is the mass non-cooperation part, right? It's when people stay home and the, uh, and the entire society comes to a halt, and that sends a really clear and powerful message to those in power that um, enough is enough or whatever. So I'm just saying that to say that, you know, watching violent repression as its own efficacy, for sure, it may really elicit shame and indignation and so on. But mass non-cooperation can work without being the subject of violent repression. So there's that. The other thing I'd just say is that I, I'm not necessarily saying, so, First, I'm not even predicting that, the, that you know, and civil disobedience is the new template, let alone just affirming that right now. I think it's what I'm trying to say is that the, the current uprising is really stretching um, the, the, the template we've had um, and expanding the repertoire of uh, techniques of protest rather than supplanting uh, the, the, the previous one. So I think that um, you, it's basically a call for a um, rich, diverse political imagination of ways to interpel, interpolate, like confront and, you know, engage with people. And um, that may not require brutal violence uh, in response to the protest. And I mean, I just say like, I find that a little bit, um, odd in a way to say, well, if we're, you know, so if civil disobedience and protest, peaceful protests are more accepted, then they work less well because people are not beaten up on camera. You see plenty, you know, pro I mean, pro numbers matter in protest. And when you see large peaceful protests, it does something regardless of whether people are beaten to a pulp uh, in protesting. So I also don't see too much to regret if that was, you know, the, the evolution, even though um, the images of the violent repressions against protesters can work to appeal to uh, the conscience of the public. Thank you. Good, good, good. Okay, I think that brings us to the end of our session and uh, leaves us with thanking our two speakers, Professor Sturkey and Professor Dalmas. Thank you very much. This was, I found this very delightful, very informative, learned a lot of things in, in a short time. Um, and um, let's all uh, join in applause for our two presenters.